Amen. Amen. Proverbs 16.1 The preparations of the heart in man and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. So I'm just basically, if you want to look at a subject matter, I'm going to focus on um, preparation. And uh, preparation is a, is a critical thing, uh, probably more than the event itself, as, we'll, as you'll hear as I try to measure this stuff out. Um, Ecclesiastes 3, we, most of us know this, it's a pretty po- popular, well-known scripture. To everything there is a season, and to a time to every purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant a time to pluck up that which is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. So with everything, timing is always critical. There is a time and a season, right? The the Lord is coming back, and He's coming back at a set time. The timing has to be perfect. When the fullness of time comes, God sent forth His Son. There had to be a fullness of time. There had to be something that had to transpire. There had to be events take place. There had to be preparations. There had to be things set up. The conditions had to be just perfect. And then once the conditions were just perfect, bang, now's the time. All right, so that's kind of what uh, the gist of what I'm, I'm talking about. Um, so for us, we are in the process of hoping for things and... Uh, we uh, have patience as we wait and we hope, and sometimes our perception is like God is uh, is taking a long time to do something. Or, but the, the the truth of the matter is, it doesn't take God long to do anything, right? At all. Once the preparation has been made, once the stage has been set, once the circumstances are right, once the time is right and ripe. And God makes his move, it doesn't take him long. He sets the time. Yeah, he sets the time, and it doesn't... What if David said, my times, or Job or David, I don't remember, he said, my times are in your hand. I ha- there are times in my life. There, there's a time for me to be born again. There's a time for me to be delivered from this. A time for me to prosper in that. A time for me to be blessed. A time for me to be chastised. You know, a time for me to... Uh, Go into seclusion and separate myself. A time to come out of seclusion and come forth. You know, there's a time. A time, a time. So, uh, Ecclesiastes 8, 6, Because to every purpose there is time and judgment, therefore the misery of man is great upon him. Well, the misery of, of, of man is great because if you don't know the time, you have to wait. There isn't a point of time. All the days of my uh, appointed time, I will wait. Till my change comes. There's a change coming for every aspect of life, every aspect of your heart that you want to be converted or that we need to be converted from the old man to new to the new man. There is a a time, a time and a place. There's a time for it. And so we hope and we wait and we have patience. And like I say, as we were waiting and we're having patience, uh, in our carnal minds, we may think, well, boy, this is taking God uh, quite a bit of time to get this thing done. But just remember, in six days, God created the heavens and the earth, right? Six days. And the evening and the morning were the first day. And the evening and the morning. So that's six. You know, that's not day like an eon of time, you know, like the day of the Lord is a thousand years and all of that. But in, the, in creation, it specifies the evening and the morning were the first day. Now, how long has a day been? You know, how long is a day? It's day is 24 hours. You think God changed changed that at any time? No, God made all that stuff consistent. So you can see his word is consistent and what he says comes to pass and what he says is always the same and it never changes. Now, I know there's a couple of special examples where the sun stood still and then went back 10 degrees, but those are exceptions. For the most part, the testimony of God is that the laws 
of the universe and the laws of creation and the motion of the planets and the sun and all of that holds a consistency to, to uh, declare the faithfulness of God. So a day is 24 hours today. A day was 24 hours 6,000 years ago. And that's the only way I could see it. Evening and the morning were the first day. So how long did it take God to make this vast universe and the heavens and the earth and the sea and all the animals that dwell therein and they wrapped up the whole thing six days? That didn't take him very long. Right. That didn't take him very long. I can't even put in 50 toilets in six days. So <laughs> let alone create a whole universe and an earth and all the creatures and everything. Well, so you see, really... God is powerful and He's an awesome God and He's a mighty God, full of power. It doesn't take Him. He's in eternity. Time is nothing to Him. What's it to God if He does something in a second or a, a day or a month or a year? Or, it doesn't take God long. It's, that's not the issue. It's not that God needs time to do anything once everything has been fulfilled and properly prepared. Properly prepared. It's us. It's us that's the hang up. It's us that remain unsanctified. God's waiting for us to become sanctified. Right? It's Lot that lingered in Sodom and Gomorrah. It's us that linger in the worldly things and involvements that we're with. It's always us. We're the hang up. We're, we're the ones <laughs> deferring the move of God, whatever, you know. Because we have to, of course, all, and then all that's necessary as well. But anyway, uh, so, once everything is done, well, let's first talk about, uh, anyway, um, so we hope, we hope for God to fulfill things and do things for us and change us and change somebody else or whatever, you know, we're hoping in all this stuff. And when, when we endure impatience for a long period of time, we think, oh boy, it's taking it to God a long time to accomplish this. And really, it doesn't take God anything, it's just... Things haven't been properly prepared. So we're, we're focusing on the idea of preparation. For instance, uh, Sabbath is the seventh day. Saturday, seventh day. And uh, Sabbath, of course, is a day of rest. You do no servile work. and It's a day that's set aside. And uh, God rested the seventh day from all his work. And, and you know, I still believe that... Uh, Sabbath should the Sabbath should be a day that's different than the other days. It shouldn't be just the same old thing. Now you can pull your ass out of the ditch. Your Christian brother's sump uh, some pump or submersible pump blows, and the only time you, you can help him fix it is a Sabbath day, and he's your brother, and he lives on a farm, and he needs the water. Well, you can go do that and redeem your brother out of his calamity on the Sabbath day, and there's no hard, fast, legal thing about Sabbath that we you know, observe like that, but it should be different. It should should be a focus on uh, casting off the thoughts and the 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 um, spirit of the world and all of that stuff, and kind of like a focus on the things of God. And there should be some sort of sanctification to the Sabbath, just not doing what you what you want, and certainly not buying and selling and whatever or or the worldly spirit. There should should be something different about the Sabbath. But now, like I said. Uh, What's more, what, what I f feel is more important than the Sabbath itself, what's even more important is preparation for the Sabbath. And you'll see it in the scriptures in the New Testament. They came, it was the preparation for the Sabbath. So for us, that would be Friday afternoon sometime. It's coming to sundown. We're approaching the Sabbath day. It's time to prepare for Sabbath. Before it gets here, you prepare for it. You start winding your activities down. I'm not always too good at this, but, but I understand the principle, and I, I try to implement this wherever I can. You start winding down, you start backing off of the worldly thoughts and the worldly activities and the things that you're doing for work and things you're doing for yourself or what have you. You start, you start, you, you start a momentum away from the worldliness and towards the spirit. You have to start preparing before the Sabbath hits. For instance, as a practical example, and I'll use myself again, if I'm working at the hotels, if, if I apply myself and, and focus and give all my might, soul, and strength, and spirit 
to uh, uh, putting in a bunch of toilets on, on Friday and, and I just go and go and go and, and really zealously just put myself into it and go as far as I can and, and then just at, the, uh, at sunset or 6 o'clock, bang, I stop doing the toilets. I come, I come home, in my mind, I've got a spiritual momentum of thinking about toilets, right? Yeah. So I'll tell you what, it's going to be about 9 or 10 o'clock before I stop thinking about putting toilets in. Because that's all I was doing all day. Yeah. So what I really need to do, and of course it differs from, from person to person, and you all work this out. But for me, what I'm going to need to do is around 3 o'clock, I'm going to have to scale down. And I'm going to have to quit a little early on Fridays so that I can get the momentum of my mind to slow down on carnal things and work issues and get it into the things of God and that sort of thing. Otherwise, Sabbath comes. I wasn't prepared, right? And my spirit is still out there working at the work. You know, you know it's right. still out there working in my heart and my spirit. It's just like uh, the children of God were in them. Um, in the wilderness, and they didn't physically go back to Egypt, a lot of them, but in their hearts, they returned back. So, I don't want to, in my heart, be at work on Sabbath day. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I could physically leave the job, but my heart's still there. Yeah. So, I got to stop a little bit early. I got to start, start preparing. Otherwise, when I get to the Sabbath, I'm not in my rest. Yeah. I'm in the day, but I'm not in the rest. You follow me? So what's more important than Sabbath itself is that you properly prepare for the Sabbath. Now you can apply this to other things. You know, people talk about the tribulation and the great tribulation, and boy, will, will, will we be able to survive the great tribulation? Well, we need to prepare for that. We need to think about it. We need to arm ourselves in the spirit of our minds. We need to, uh, you know... Uh, Get ourselves in the situation and our lifestyle and everything else where we're, we're ready to lose things. We're ready for a, a sudden change. We're ready for the new world order to come swallow us up or whatever. As, as we know, this fourth beast, this new world order is diverse. It's different than any other kind of governmental system. It's different than any kind of a move of Antichrist that's ever been in any other generation. It's going to stamp out all the resistance. It's going to be an overwhelming worldwide spirit of Antichrist swallowing up everything godly, everything righteous, everything uh, to do with Jesus Christ. And so we have to be ready for it. We need to prepare. So that once we uh, get in the Great Tribulation, we will be prepared. Hmm. And what about this life? You know, and you think about salvation and eternal life. And uh, all of that kind of stuff. Well, the hope of eternal life is not going to do me any good unless I'm prepared for eternal life. What, what's our life all about? You know, and you, you go back to simplicity. You think of things very, very simple. Well, what is the essence of why we're here in this life? What's our training ground? It's our preparation. We have to be prepared to inherit eternal life. We have to be created into new creatures. Right? Circumcision doesn't avail you anything. Uncircumcision doesn't avail you anything. The things you accomplish don't avail you anything. The things that you obtain and possess don't avail you anything. Even your relationships don't avail you anything. Your practices, your thoughts... And nothing avails you anything unless during all of that you have become a new creature. Yeah. And that becoming a new preacher is us preparing for eternal life. So in essence, in a nutshell, why are we here? To prepare to meet thy God. Lord. Prepare to meet thy God. That's why we're here. That's the only thing we're here for. Yeah. And to attain unto the resurrection from the dead. No. We can do lots of different things in this life, and uh, but if somehow it doesn't all contribute to this preparation to meet God, then right, we could become rich, we can become famous. Well, you know how that is. Well, what's that going to do? That's not going to help us. We could gain the whole world, lose our soul. But that's what we're that's what we're here for to prepare to meet God. And that's how we view every experience as a, as a learning tool, a learning process, a tool in the hand of God to mold our hearts 
and to direct us into the trust in God to always bring us through experiences that increase our hope in God's power to deliver, God's power to resurrect, God's power to renew, God's power to deliver. Always focusing and keeping right before our conscience the, the very vital fact, the vital truth that this is an exercise about teaching our hearts to con- completely rely on God's sufficiency, God's power, God's provisions. We have to be totally sold out to God because if we're not, then we will be emboldened to trust in our own righteousness or trust in something that would fall out into iniquity and then we would suffer the same fate as Lucifer. So this is the whole thing of dealing with us and dealing, teaching us the difference between good and evil. Taking us through experiences. It's all for preparation, preparation, preparation. Once a soul has been fully prepared for eternal life, do you think God waits one nanosecond to take you? No, once your heart is perfected and made ready for eternal life, that's it. God will let you drop dead right there and off you go. Your spirit's been made perfect. You know, we've heard uh, various preachers talk about it. It's like when the fruit is ripe, you, you pick it. There's very, very, very small window of time when the fruit has its per- perfect ripeness. You don't want to pick it before it's ripe. If you wait too long after it's ripe, it'll rot on the tree. So once God has brought you to perfection, bang, He's going to pick you. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. He's picking you like the perfect ripe piece of fruit and there you will perfect, you'll, you will be, you will remain and be preserved in that perfect state through all eternity. If God leaves you too long, maybe you have opportunity to be corrupted again or what have you. So, so what's the whole deal here? The whole deal is preparation, preparation. That's God, all God's interested in us here now in this life is it all has to do with preparation. And everything has a preparation. And so there, there is a season and a time for every purpose. And the reason that there's a time is because before something happens, before God does something or before the devil does something, there has to be a preparation made. A preparation has to be made. You know, you're going to bake a loaf of bread. You don't just bake a loaf of bread. You have to make preparation. You have to get your stuff out, lay it out on the counter, and then you have to turn the stove on, let it heat up, preheat, and you have to mix your dough. And there's... There's a procedure, there's a process, there's a preparation to everything. Uh, and it came to pass in process of time that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground and Abel brought forth his uh, sacrifice. It came to pass in process of time. When a process over a period of time, uh, something became fulfilled and prepared, then then it was time for whatever the purpose is. So there's a purpose for everything, and the timing is always critical. Timing. All right. Um, now, one thing is, another thing uh, we, wait, we wait for God on is sometimes we wait for God uh, on God for vindication, or we wait on God to um, manifest something or reveal the difference between righteousness and wickedness and you know, to, uh, well, I'll just say vindication. But, um, or we, the, God God has a judgment, right? There is judgment. But judgment is not executed speedily. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, it is in the hearts of the sons of men to do evil continually. Mm-hmm. Right? So, you do an evil work, you don't necessarily get an instant judgment. God doesn't work like that. If you do an evil work, God has to execute in in His justice for Him to be fair. You do an evil work, God has to provide all opportunity for you to repent from the work. He has to exercise all His long-suffering. He has to send warnings. He has to send consequence for your sin, trying to get you to return. He has to do all of that to fulfill justice. You understand? That's why God winked at the ignorance of man in times past. Before Jesus came, there was no light. Man did not know the eternal purpose of God. 
They were in ignorance and they worshipped gods of wood and stone and they, they had all their different devices and God winked at. He didn't stir up all his judgment. It wouldn't be fair. It wouldn't be right. He had to exercise long suffering because light had not come into the world. So therefore, you do an evil work and the sentence doesn't come instantaneously. The sentence doesn't come. You know, you sow a seed, you sow corn, you sow wheat, you sow rye, you sow whatever, sunflower seeds, whatever. Do you think you see the fruit of it come up in an instant? No, you don't. It takes a process. There's a preparation. What you, what you reap comes down the road. Sentence against an evil work is not speedily executed. That's why I, I, for the most part, I shun and I reject every, every kind of, um, plea when people try to impress you with their, they, they, they try to demonstrate a so-called integrity by saying, well, if I'm not preaching right or if I'm not mad at God, may God strike me dead right now then. Well, God doesn't work like that. God just doesn't work like that. Like one in a billion God might, might do that. Might do that. But that's not how God works. You do an evil work, you're preaching something that's wrong, God isn't going to strike you dead. He's going to go through a whole process before it happens. God has to prepare himself the proper righteous path for judgment. God wants to judge the wicked, but he can't just have the wicked do an evil deed and bang, judge them, because he has to provide long-suffering. He has to provide warnings. He has to provide all of this stuff so that he's just when he does does his judgment. God God himself is preparing himself uh, a justifiable path, a justifiable path for his judgment. And that is a process in a preparation. Even God is trying to prepare himself for the day of judgment so that when he put, when he saves us and damns the others, he'll be justified. He'll be prepared. He'll be able to do it in all clearness. Knowing that he gave every opportunity, that they have no excuse, no call or plea of ignorance. So God doesn't do things like like that. Uh, you understand? Well, if, and if I'm not a true teacher from God, may God just strike me dead right here and now. I, those are un, very unknowledgeable statements, and they don't they don't really prove anything. That's theatrical. Yeah, it's kind of theatrical. It's probably dramatic. Trying to tout yourself as having this integrity, yeah. and it doesn't say one thing or another about your integrity. I'll say that much. Really, it doesn't. Okay, because the sentence is not speedily executed. How about Psalm 50? You know, you're a partaker with an adulterer, you consent with a thief, you slander your mother's son, your brother and your sister, and these things thou hast done, and I kept silence. I kept silence. And just like when the woman sinned, she was caught in adultery. But this one was caught in adultery. What did Jesus do? Oh, let's get her. No, he didn't do that either. He, what did Jesus do? He didn't even... He, he, he stooped and wrote in the ground as though he heard them not. Yeah. He kept silence. You're doing evil things. God's keeping silence. And you think that's vindication? Right? Oh, well, then how come I'm still here doing my thing? And God has, you know, whatever, hasn't hasn't done anything to me yet. And we don't want to mistake the silence of God as approval when it's actually just God trying to prepare judgment to be righteous. In, In other words, God keeps silence and you think it's vindication. Maybe God's just reserving you and he's paving the path to justify his righteous judgment against you. And maybe that's what the silence is. Well, what do you know? One way or another. Right? We've got to work this out with fear and trembling. Like, don't misunderstand God. God's not slack like some men count slackness. He's not slack. And, and the other thing we've got to remember is that the imputing of iniquity and the non-imputing of iniquity. We need to be reminded The man to whom God does not impute iniquity is the man who has no guile. He's not operating deceitfully. He's not operating in secret deliberation and craft and provision 
for his sin. If, if you're doing all of that stuff, then the scripture has another description for that kind of iniquity when you're doing it deliberately in craft and all of that stuff. Then you're like, I think it was Jeremiah, your iniquity is marked before me. And it is imputable. There is an imputable iniquity and there is a non-imputable iniquity. And the non-imputable iniquity for the most part is when you sin through ignorance. And the imputable iniquity, for the most part, is when you are committing iniquity with deceit and guile. But another thing God has to do is He has to let the cup of iniquity become full. Right? I can't slap my kid's hands for stealing the cookie when he never, never stole the cookie. I can look over across the room or across the room at my son and I can see him eyeing up the cookie jar and I know he's crafty. He's just, he's just stirring up a, a crafty plan to get the cookie when he's not supposed to have, a, have the cookie, right? I can know that. But I can't spank him for it because in his conscience he'll go, what did you spank me for? I didn't do nothing, right? So even though I know he's up to no good, I, I can't just execute the judgment right away I gotta prepare. I gotta wait. I gotta wait for a preparation. I gotta wait until it comes to the full. And then he actually comes out with the expression of his intention. And his hand is in the jar. Now I can, now I'm justified, right? Now if I, I spank him, now he knows what it's for. Now it can actually do a uh, constructive work of correction. And that's the way God is with us, you know. Uh, he, God did not, uh, okay, what's the scripture here I'm looking for? Genesis fifteen sixteen. The fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Sometimes God withholds and is silent against evildoers simply because He wants the iniquity to come to the full. And that has to do more with the justice of God justifying His expressions of judgment. All right. Now... Getting back to what I was saying about um, it doesn't take God long. If God shows His supernatural power, how long does it take to, for Him to heal a body, to make a paralyzed man walk again, to see a blind man see, to let a blind man see? How long does it take Him? Rise up, take up your bed and walk. <laughs> Done. Yeah. I say unto the damsel, I, <laughs> I say unto you, damsel, arise. Up she gets. Didn't take two two nanoseconds for for it to happen, right? It, it's not going to take God long to do anything once it's been prepared, once everything has been fulfilled. You know, why didn't Jesus come right in the beginning? Oh, Adam and Eve sinned. Jesus could have come, died on the cross, and 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 it was all over. Well, then we we wouldn't be saved then, right? Because it would just be such a short work. No, there had to be something where God had to let man and sin and iniquity uh, manifest and demonstrate and show out and come to the full. And there, there is a critical point in all of history, a critical point in time, which was the absolute perfect time for Christ to come into the world. In fact, it was the only time he could come into the world where God could accomplish everything He wanted to do, save everybody He had preordained and foreknew that would inherit eternal life. So the timing was critical. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth His Son, made of a woman, made under the law, and He uh, made Him in the likeness of sinful flesh, one place, I think in Romans, and for sin in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, and he condemned sin in the flesh. Okay, and when Christ is operating in you, you, you are condemning sin with your righteous life in the flesh. Okay, now we have uh, demonstrations of the new man, demonstrations of the old man, and we're in that rustling conflict all throughout our lives. But anyway, so it came to pass in process of time, came brought forth of the fruit of the ground and offering unto the Lord and Abel 
brought the firstlings of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect to Abel to his offering, but unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth and his countenance fell. Before we bring a true sacrifice of righteousness in our bodies unto the Lord, we have to go through a process. We have to mature as Christians. We have to have a preparation to offer that sacrifice. And if we are going to offer, offer a sacrifice of dead works, of our own imagination, some religious works, some self-righteous works, that also is a process of time. It's a process of time. Everything is a process of time. A preparation, in other words. That's why we looked at the parable of the virgins, five wise and five foolish. Give us of your oil. Well, we only have enough for ourselves. And if we give you some of ours, then our lamps will go out. And we want to be saved. So go out and buy for yourself. In other words, go through the process. Go through your experiences and trials of faith. And, and get, you know, get your increase in faith through your process of time. Get your faith through your process of time, through your experience. Lord, increase our faith. It was not a magic wand that He held over their hands and increased their faith. The true work of God creating faith and increasing faith and giving it increase, the true work of God and bringing forth the righteous nature in you, that true work of God is a process involving time and experience and spirit and word and, and success and failures and exercise of praying to God, seeking to God, bringing you through many experiences. That is a process of time. That is a preparation of heart. And once your heart has been properly prepared, then God can allow His righteousness to manifest through you because your heart has been prepared. You've learned through the experiences that, that your sufficiency and trust must be upon God and not upon yourself. You will not mistake the manifestation of God's righteousness in you for your own righteousness. You follow that? Peter was on the... Uh, the, the disciples were in the boat during the storm and uh, they see Jesus come walking on the water. Peter said, Lord, if that be you, bid me come. And he says, come. And Peter, by faith, he steps out of the boat. Okay, And then he begins to walk on the water. But then he sees all the winds and the waves and everything. And then, and then he uh, begins to sink and says, Lord, save me. So even you can step out and walk on the water, so to speak, on your own faith. But, but still... Uh, get your eyes, have the potential to get your eyes off of Jesus. Get your eyes off of the sufficiency that's of, of God and then you need Jesus to save you <laughs> from drowning. What I'm saying is uh, you have to have that experience and that's a process and a preparation. So here's what I'm saying. <laughs> I'll say it again. What's more important than the work itself is being prepared for the work. <laughs> What's more important than Sabbath itself is prepare for the Sabbath. What's more important than uh, the the idea of salvation is prepare to be prepare to meet your God. What's more important than thinking about the tribulation is prepare for the tribulation. If you uh, you know God uh, Jesus told us to pray always that you may escape that you may be able to escape all these things and to be able to stand before the Son of Man. So to pray that we can be prepared for all of that. Okay, once the extensive, full, comprehensive, complete preparation is fulfilled that God wants done, then the execution of Him giving you what you need or what you were waiting for and the fulfillment of what He promised can be swift and sudden. Once the fullness of time comes, right? How about the day of uh, Pentecost, right? And suddenly, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, all the preparations had been made. Jesus had come. He fulfilled His ministry. He died on the cross. He was raised from the dead. He presented His holy blood upon the mercy seat, which covered the sins of the world. And now, God was able through Jesus Christ and through His sacrifice was able in His justice to pour out the Holy Ghost, the potential of God's righteousness and pour it out upon all flesh. 
He was able to do that. Before he wasn't able to do that. Why? And that we, we covered that in the uh, teachings of atonement. How can a righteous God give his righteousness to an unrighteous people? An un- unrighteous person. Because that's not right. That's not fair, right? Why should God give his righteousness to a man who is sinful and unrighteous? The only way you could do it in, in, uh, in reference to perfect justice is that Jesus died and paid a penalty and took a penalty for sins that he was not worthy of that penalty. Right? That means God owes him one. You understand? The, the balances of judgment were tipped ag- against Jesus. He didn't do no evil. He did not sin. Guile was not found in his mouth. He died. Uh, he was the perfect sacrifice. He who knew no sin became sin. So that is an injustice that was done to Jesus to bear the sins of the whole world when he didn't commit any of those sins. In order for God to make that right, then God, to balance that out, must now pour out his righteousness upon sinful men who do not deserve his righteousness. And that balances the scales of justice back again. So that makes God able to pour out the Holy Ghost as an act of justice. Not an act of your worthiness. As an act of justice. He is faithful and just. He has to forgive your sins because he put them on Jesus who didn't deserve them. Now he has to take the penalty away from you who are worthy of it to balance judgment. Of course, there are criteria to receive the forgiveness of sins and everything else. I'm not going to go into that. But once that preparation is done, once Jesus came and fulfilled all of that, and the day of Pentecost was fully come, suddenly, they were all in the upper room and they were praying and they were waiting and Gee, you know, Jesus said, wait in Jerusalem until you receive the promise of the Father. And I guess about the ninth or tenth day, they're saying, boy, it's certainly taking God a long time to do this. Well, no, it's not take, it doesn't take God a long time to do anything. Just God was waiting. There's a preparation and there's an exact perfect time for the day of Pentecost to fully come. And it had to happen on that day of Pentecost when it had fully come. And so they were waiting and they were waiting. And once everything was prepared... Everything was fulfilled. Suddenly. Suddenly. All of a sudden. Out of nowhere. Sound of a rushing mighty wind. Cloven tongues of fire sat upon each one of them. All filled with the Holy Ghost. Began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them on earth. And there it was. The the age of grace. The dispensation of grace. The pouring out of the Holy Ghost upon all flesh had begun. And that was suddenly. So now let's talk about the word suddenly. Because once preparation, here's the concept. The concept is preparation. And sometimes the preparation can be long and drawn out. But preparation is necessary so that you are in the right condition and the right state to receive what God wants to give you. So that you will handle it righteously. You'll be able to handle it. And also... Preparation must be made so that God can either give you blessing or he can bestow or measure out to you judgment in a way that is just, that fulfills justice. So God can be just in doing it. And so that you will comprehend hopefully what it's all about, especially in terms of judgment. If God judges you, the judgment isn't going to do you any good unless you're able in your conscience to... um, uh, correlate the penalty with the offense that you committed. Oh, this is happening to me because I sinned against God and I did thus and thus and so and so. Right? If, if that work goes on in your conscience, you become convinced of your sin. Then you can, uh, in all clearness, confess and forsake it before God, then that, that's good. But if you get a whooping and you're blind and you don't know why you're getting a whooping, that isn't going to do a whole lot of good. Because it's not going to motivate you to change what you're doing. Because you're not even conscious of what you're doing wrong. right? Or if you're getting a whooping and a scourge from God and you keep claiming it's for righteousness sake and they're speaking all manner against me falsely and it's actually because it's not false but it's actually because of the wickedness that you're doing. Well, that isn't going to do any good either. All right. Now, yeah, so um, preparation and then once preparation is done, Things happen suddenly. And this this often happens most of the time, I would say. Often at least and probably 
most or all of the time, with God or with the devil. And I'm just going to say it in reference to both again. We're just looking at this as a kind of a cause and effect principle, preparation, and then once everything's been prepared, that's it. Well, let me put it in another allegory. I'm in the process of installing 75 toilets in one place, 75 toilets. So what do I do? I have to make preparation. I have to go into every room and find out, okay, what kind of toilets are these? All right. How far are the toilets out from the wall? Because some toilets are made to rough in at 12 inches, some at 10. Right, I've got to make sure i got the right toilet to, that, that will fit in the, in the place. I have to order the right toilets. Then I see all kinds of preparation. Okay, is there any damage in the tile floors? Then I'm going to have to find out, are there any ta- uh, damage in the toilet flange? A lot of these toilets are loose that I'm, that I'm replacing. Why are they loose? Did the bolts just come loose or are the flanges broken? Then I'll have to replace the flanges. Oh, look, here's some tile. Some, the, the, the guy who p- put the tile on the ceram- ceramic tile on the floor, he missed a few spots. I'm going to have to fill them in with cement. So I'm going to have to bring the cement. And then, of course, I'm going to have to take the old toilets out first. Now the new toilets sit higher than the old ones, so the supply tubes may not reach. I'll have to measure and see, do I need new supply tubes? See, on and on you go. On and on and on and on and on, on you go. There's a whole lot of, of extensive, detailed, comprehensive things of knowledge and the state of the toilet and the state of the floor. I'm going to have to scope it out and... Get understanding on all of that stuff before I can even think to begin to put in the new toilets. Of course, then the new toilets come in. I've got to think about distributing them all uh, throughout a hotel where the, whole, the length of the building is 350 feet. And I'm going to have to take 75 toilets and, and, and distribute them, right? Well, all, and then what, what if the floors aren't level? Then I'll need some shims because, so the toilets will sit and they won't rock back and forth. Yeah. Oh, how about the seals? What kind of seals do I want? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? How much preparation do I have to do? So that's why I go through all of this stuff. Like the other day, and I went through, and I'll, I'll do like 10 rooms at a time, and I'll do nothing but prepare. Well, I'll, do sit, I'll sit down, and I'll do nothing but open boxes of new toilets. And then I'll, I'll have to deal with all the cardboard that, and the huge boxes and the bags and the packing materials. And so I have to... Get the, or you know, put that in a way where I can get all that stuff, uh, deal with it and stack it up either for disposal or recycling, and and then I'll assemble all the toilets. Okay, that's prepared. The toilets have been prepared. I've assembled all the toilets, and there I got ten toilets in one room. Now I got to go down all those ten rooms. First thing I got to do is uh, whatever. I got to turn off all the valves. Then I got to flush the toilet. Then I got to get the residue of the waters out of the old toilets. Either I scoop it up or I vacuum it up or I put uh, towels in there and squeeze it out into a bucket, whatever. And, and then I got to take the toilets off. Then I got to survey the flanges. Then I've got to look at the supply tubes. Then I got to repair any damages on the ceramic tile floors. Then I have to you know, fix any flanges that are broken. And, uh, and I go through all of this preparation to set up 10 rooms to get ready to receive the new toilets. And it gets involved. And the person who's watching me may say, that guy has been sitting here working on that toilet job for six hours and he hasn't got a single toilet in there yet. <laughs> What's taking him so long? Hey, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Because I am preparing. There's no sense me even trying to put the toilets in until I am prepared. And if I do my preparation right... And if I'm comprehensive and extensive, and if I wait till the fullness of preparation is accomplished, then when I start to put those toilets in, you just watch. I'll roll into a room, I'll drop the toilet, put the bolts down, put the supply tube in, and I'm done in 10 minutes. And I do the next one. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, after a long period of preparation, what you think is a long period of time, and nothing's happened, nothing's getting accomplished. What do you see? After that preparation, in a very short period of time, all of a sudden, wow, look how fast those toilets are going in. Wow, it hardly took him any time at all. Why? I had the right preparation. 
Preparation's done. How long did it take God to pour out the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost, fill them all up and demonstrate this mighty power? Boom! All of a sudden, there it was. All right, so that's why I'm saying God or the devil. You know, God is not a God that just, you do something wrong, ah, strike him dead. God very, 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 very rarely does that. Very rarely does that. So yeah, that's not how God operates. If I'm doing something wrong, God, strike me dead. No, that's not how God operates. He just doesn't work like that. Now, um, so whenever you're preparing something, what is there? There's a wait. You're hoping, you're waiting, you're patiently waiting. What are we waiting for? For the preparations to be fulfilled. The answer of the... The preparations of the heart and the answer of the tongue. From the Lord. From the, Lord. the preparations. You know, Paul preached, I think, that was it Lydia in the book of Acts, whose heart the Lord opened. Mm -hmm. That means her heart had been prepared to receive the word of God. God had brought her through experiences, and God does this with us. God lets us, you know, Isaiah says, before, before you knew me, I girded you. I supported you. I got involved in the affairs of your life. Before you even knew me, God said. Ordained from the foundation of the world. Before we even were saved, God was influencing our experiences to teach our hearts things that would prepare us to want to receive the word of God when the fullness of time came. And just like in the, from the beginning of history to the end of history, beginning of time to the end of time, uh, when that fullness of time comes, God sent forth His Son. In the same manner, in the same pattern, every one of us as individuals, we go through life and there is a fullness of time that we come through life before God can send His Son or send us His word of salvation. Our hearts have to be ready. Have to be prepared. So there's a time to preach and there's a time not to preach. And when we are fishers of men, one of the first things we, we fish for is, has God prepared this heart? Has God brought this person through enough experiences and afflictions that he's hungering for something more? Is he looking for God? Is he looking for eternal life? Is he looking for a relationship with Jesus Christ because he's just disenchanted with the world, disenchanted with life? You know, you've got to be disenchanted with this life, with this world, before you can ever hope to accomplish an actual genuine salvation. You've got to, we've got to get like Job. My soul is weary of my life. I want a different life. I want a new life. I'm disenchanted with the world. It's got nothing for me. Right? That's The world is crucified unto me. So, yeah, the heart has to be prepared. And the Lord has to open the heart. Um, Jesus said, uh, well, he said that in every man who has learned of the Father, every man who has learned of the Father will know the, of the doctrine that I speak whether it's mine or the Father who sent me. So the implication there is before you are able to stand before Jesus or another Christian or a minister and hear the Word of God, because you know uh, Jesus to send you the Word of God is going to, now he's going to do it through a member of the body, right? Because we're standing sort of in proxy or in, in the stead of Christ. He's going to send Word and stuff through us. Then, then um, before you can do that, you have to be. It, what the implication is is that you have to have come through experiences where somehow you've intuitively you've learned from the Father already. You've learned something already in life about the vanity of this life without God. And so, if any man has learned from the Father through the experiences of his own life about that stuff then he will be able to receive the word of God when it's preached to him. You understand? So God has girded us before we even knew him. He, he in, got involved in our experiences and began fashioning our hearts. And like, for instance, I always look back and, and I always felt like I was a reject. I don't fit in. I don't fit in with the sports crowd. I don't fit in with the music crowd. I don't fit in with the drama crowd. I don't fit in with the 
the intellects. I don't fit in with I always reject. I tried to get acceptance or fit in and I tried to fit in and I tried to fit in and I just never felt like I could fit in. I couldn't fit in. I couldn't fit in. I was never a part of it. And that's God teaching me. That's God getting involved. That's God on purpose never letting me be identify or correlate or identify with with worldliness or worldly spirits. Always leaving me in that empty place so that when the fullness of time was, would come, I would receive be identifying with Jesus Christ. No, God forbid we should find some kind of fulfillment in identifying with sports or identifying with music or identifying with whatever in the world. Politics. And then getting sold, getting our hearts sold that that's what our purpose is. Then it would be very, very hard to, to drag us out of that to pursue eternal life where we have to forsake all. Alright, so that was... a. God preparing my heart without me even realizing it, keeping me in that state of never being accepted, never or never feeling accepted or never quite fitting in with anything because he wanted me sanctified until the word of salvation came. And it's the same with all of us to a certain extent. So you learn of the Father. You can learn of the Father before you're even saved. And that is God preparing you, the preparation of the heart. And that's all from God. As it's written in the prophets, they shall all be taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and learned of the Father comes to me. And if any man will do the will of God, he'll know the doctrine, whether I speak of myself or not. All right, so patience becomes a vital part of preparation. Because while you're being prepared, you have to wait for the preparation to do its work and be fulfilled. That's why any man lacks wisdom, let him ask God who gives to all men liberally, upbraideth not, but let him ask in faith nothing wavering because wisdom is going to come through a preparation of the heart uh, and it's uh, you're going to have to have patience to go through experiences which are going to leave you with wisdom. So patience is an element of preparation that becomes very relevant. While you are being prepared to receive wisdom, you're going through experiences that will instruct you in wisdom. Those experiences involve successes and failures, blessings and sufferings, and their preparations. And once they're accomplished, you'll have wisdom. Suddenly, suddenly, now on the side of evil... I guess we'll look at some of that. Well, I'll bounce back and forth between what's what's righteous and what's not righteous. Um, now, when they say peace and safety, then sudden. sudden destruction. I have no pleasure, God says, in the death of the wicked. Anybody who is a, what do they call it, masochist, who gets pleasure in watching other people suffer, they try to make them suffer and inflict pain, and they try to prolong it as long as possible. Right? God's not like that, even with the wicked. God's tender mercies are over all his works. You know, God is only destroying the wicked out of necessity. And he's doing it as an act of righteous judgment because they have blasphemed and rejected the Holy Ghost all their life. And God will be just to do that. But as I live, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? And so when Jesus comes back, He'll destroy the, the wicked with the right. brightness of his coming. It, it's going to be like talk about nuclear energy times a, a, a billion gazillion. That'll be the radiant energy of the righteousness of God manifested through Jesus Christ coming back in all of his glory. You know, if you want to look at it like that, all everything wicked will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. Think about the nuclear bombs in Hiroshima. People who are at the center of that explosion instantly vaporized. Yeah. Nothing left of them. Nothing left. You know, you think maybe it's not a bad way to go. You wouldn't know what hit you. And in a split second, your vapor, you probably wouldn't have even felt any pain. Who knows? I'm just saying I'm not... I'm not justifying it. I'm not saying it was a good thing or anything. But think of the power and energy and glory of Jesus Christ. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Destroy the wicked with the brightness of his coming. That's it. I'm going to destroy the wicked. I'm going to destroy them suddenly. I'm going to get this over with because it has to be done. 
<laughs> it has to be done. It's a necessity to preserve that which is holy and righteous. Poof! Destroy them. Suddenly, it's not going to take long. God is preparing the righteous path for his judgment to be manifested. Once it's prepared, poof. Once the time has fully come, Jesus will come back. At the set time, the time appointed, at the perfect time when no one else can be saved and so on. You know, and when it's time to get into the millennium, if he doesn't come at that precise moment, then total destruction would take place or mankind would be, be able to go on to try to uh, intrude into the very heaven itself and try to kick God off his throne or whatever, however you want to look at that. God is going to let this thing go as just as, as far as he can possibly let it go to accomplish his purpose and save everyone who can be saved and the ultimate nanosecond that the person, <laughs> that last person or whatever, the, everything's accomplished, bang, Jesus is coming back. It's not going to take him long to destroy the wicked because he doesn't have any pleasure in it. No, and that's the nature of God. If God gives all, if he extends all this long suffering and all this warning and all this mixture of judgment and mercy to try to strive with man and plea with man and warn man and everything else, then once you have exhausted that long suffering of God, <laughs> instant. It's not going to take God long to deal with you at all. Whether it's in salvation or damnation. Whether it's in judgment or, bl or m blessing and mercy. Now, once that full comprehensive preparation is done and accomplished, then the execution and fulfillment is mostly and probably always swift and sudden. And, and it's on the side of good or the side of evil. He that being often reproved, hardened his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed. That without remedy. When... Um, when I used to preach a lot on Passover, when Passover would come, I'd preach out of Second Chronicles 29 and 30, which is the two chapters of restoration, a pattern of restoration in the Old Testament where they restored the Passover. They had not kept Passover in a long time the way it was written in the Old Testament, and Hezekiah had restored everything. And uh, I'm not going to read the whole chapter. I have, I have it all here, but um, I'm just trying to jog your memory about this stuff. Because I'm, I want to say something here also about in reference to suddenly. So Hezekiah began to reign when he was 25. He reigned 29 years. He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. I'm going to paraphrase this. He brought in the priests, the Levites, and said, Hear me, Levites, sanctify yourself, sanctify the house of God, and get the filthiness out. That was the Levites, the ministering. You know, the Levites, the one that taught the good knowledge of the Lord, the ministering brothers, the Levites, the ones who had no inheritance in this life because the Lord was their inheritance. The Levites, representing the elect of God, who when Moses drew the line in the golden calf, the Levites went on Moses' side. Levites, that represents God's elect. Okay, carry the filthiness out of the holy place. Our fathers have trespassed and done what's evil. They've shut the doors of the ports. They put out the lamps. They have not burned incense you know, and, okay. So therefore the wrath of the Lord was on Judah and Jerusalem. Our fathers have fallen by the sword. Our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity because of this. And this is something we have to understand. We have wives and children that have gone out into the world into captivity. Our wives and children are not always gone out into captivity because our wives and children are so stubborn and rebellious. In this case, when the church was out of order, when it was apostatized, what did the Hezekiah said? Our, our wives and our daughters are in captivity uh, because we, we, us Levites, we, we weren't sanctified. We haven't offered incense. We have had filthiness in this place. Therefore, our wives and our children have been delivered over to captivity. There's not only one reason why people go into captivity. You understand what I'm, I'm saying there? There is some onus of responsibility on the Levites as being the cause, the apostasy of the Levites and the, of the house of Israel in general for that to happen. So, my sons, be not, not negligent. God hath chosen you to stand before him to serve him and to minister unto him and burn incense. So then they arose and it names a bunch of Levites in particular and they go into the inner part of the house of the Lord to cleanse it. And that would be ministering about the you know inner workings of our heart and the 
trying to stir up the uh, divine nature and getting purged and cleansed from the inside out. In other words, the inner inner part. And they cleansed it and brought out the uncleanness they found into the court of the house of the Lord. And the Levites took it to carry it out to the brook Kedron. So they sanctified the house of God and so on. And a king, then they went into the king to the king Hezekiah and said, "We have cleansed all the house of the Lord. Moreover, all the vessels which King Ahaz in his reign did cast away in his transgression have we prepared and sanctified. Behold, they are before the altar of the Lord." Okay, and Hezekiah the king rose early, gathered the rulers of the city, went up to the house of the Lord, and they brought the bullocks and they did sacrifices and preparations and everything else. And uh, and they began to worship and the singers sang and the congregation worshipped and the trumpeters sounded and they continued until the burnt offering was finished. This is all preparation now. This, they're all preparing. They're cleansing the house of the Lord. They're making sacrifice. They're worshipping. They're singing. They're doing all of this. They're sounding the trumpets. And then Hezekiah finally answers and says, Now you have consecrated yourself unto the Lord. Come near, bring sacrifices and thank offerings into the house of the Lord. And the congregation brought in sacrifices and thank offerings, and as many as were of a free heart, burnt offerings. And there was, there was too few priests to, do, to deal with all the sacrifices. Uh, that was the high priesthood. So the Levites helped them, and then the work was ended. And till the other priests had sanctified themselves, for the Levites were more upright in heart to sanctify themselves than the priests. And also the burnt offerings were in abundance, with the fat of peace offerings, the drink offerings for every burnt offering. So the service of the house of the Lord was set in order. And others prepared the service of the house of the Lord, prepared, sacrificed, sacrifices made, and everything was set in order. And Hezekiah rejoiced in all the people that God had prepared the people for the thing was done suddenly. suddenly. Okay. Here's what I'm talking. I'm talking about preparation and then things happen suddenly. doesn't take long. Right? I mean, we're being prepared, prepared, and we're waiting for this end of the age. And when is it going to happen? And I thought it was going to happen in 2015, 2010, 2005. I thought, thought the millennium turn would be a, a critical time. Nothing seemed to happen. We're, what's going on? And well, I'll tell you what. We'd be all prepared, and then we'll get to this great tribulation, and all of a sudden, and it'll all be over. Or whatever you're waiting for from God. And it's the same, like I say, it's the same with the works of, of evil. Proverbs six twelve to 15 A naughty person, a wicked man, walks with a froward mouth. He winks with his eyes. He speaks with his feet. He teacheth with his fingers. Frowardness is in his heart. He deviseth mischief continually. He soweth discord. Therefore shall his calamity come suddenly. suddenly. Suddenly shall he be broken without remedy. For man also knoweth, Ecclesiastes 9 and 12, as the fishes that are taken in an evil net and as the birds that are caught in the snare, so are the sons of men snared in an evil time when it falleth suddenly suddenly upon them. Okay. So with the coming of the Lord, we don't want to be among those that uh, lest he find you sleeping and he come suddenly. Right? We want to be ready. We want to be prepared. We don't want to be caught unawares. Now, when you see this pattern of things, preparation, 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 endurance, waiting, all this stuff, then a bunch of preparation is made and then suddenly... Think of that in reference to the New World Order. The New World Order, they're going to follow the same pattern. They're going to, they're going to prepare, 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 set things up, work in the background, cultivate way, people's ways of thinking through the media, brainwash them, propaganda through all the mainstream media. You know, they're, they're preparing, 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 preparing. You know, okay, is the tribulation yet? I don't know. Is it next year? Okay, is it the next year after that? Is it that next year? Boy, we've been waiting, waiting, waiting. Seems like there's all this talk and stuff about New World Order, but when is it going to happen? Is it, it's, been, it's going on. We've been talking about this for the last 20 years. Preparation, 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 preparation. Don't be surprised that once the New World Order got all their stuff, groundwork laid, suddenly. <laughs> 
Uh, down it comes. Mark of the beast. All that stuff. Interesting. I'm going to point this out. Uh, yesterday was it yesterday? We were talking, and Carl started talking about, you know, we were just talking about the end of the age. Well, yeah, but then this has to happen, and that has to happen. And he, he brought up the second horn has to be broken, Iran and Iraq, right? Well, Iraq is the first horn broken. Iran has to be broken, and yet it seems like it's been like 12 years or whatever since the first horn was broken. And But Carl was just sort of thinking on it and, and thinking that, well, but... When the second horn, who knows that once the second horn gets broken, things could happen all of a sudden, really quickly. So I kind of took note of that and started to think about it. Then I got home, and uh, Brother Paul uh, pretty called me, and he talk, and he began to talk about the same thing, the second horn. Then I went to the newspaper and found out that in Iran, their top nuclear scientist has just been assassinated because they figure he was the guy behind all the, the uh, nuclear bomb stuff. He was the mastermind for Iran on all the nuclear bomb stuff. And he's just been assassinated. And the Iranians are mad. And they're beating the war drums. Why, if, it's, if we find out it's Israel who did this, or the U.S., or whatever it is that they're saying, they're, they're threatening now. There's going to be retaliation. Are, are we beating the war drums? Is this in the air now? The Iran going down? Then there's other, throw other things into the mix, like Donald Trump may maybe go into war with Iran and it'll disrupt the whole presidential transfer thing and all of that. So lots of people talk about lots of things. But what I'm saying is, once it's all ready, it can happen suddenly, can it? It can happen very suddenly. So be ready in such a time as you think not. Because that's the way it is. That's just the nature of things in the spirit. Prepare, preparation, 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 preparation. Right? More than 500 people were at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, witnessed His resurrection. Right? Only 120 in the upper room. Because I guess they didn't follow through on the waiting and the preparation. And during the preparation, there's always a time to Kind of get slack. Uh, there's always a potential to get slack and saying, well, it hasn't happened yet. It hasn't happened yet. Maybe we got another 10 years. Maybe we got another 20 years. Who knows? But you have to, and I don't know how long we have, but all I'm saying is, once things are prepared, don't think it's going to take long for God or the devil to make their move. Don't think it's going to take long. Because this is the nature of the spiritual unfoldings and the unfoldings of the events of the Bible and everything else. Preparation, preparation, preparation. Waiting, waiting, waiting. Once it's in order, it's like the toilets. You know, once I get ten rooms fully prepared, you watch how fast those toilets go down. They are going in fast. Suddenly. All right. Prepare to meet your God. More important than... Probably the events themselves is the preparation for the events. Hmm. And more, more important than believing in eternal life is preparing for eternal life. More important than the Sabbath is prepare for the Sabbath. Otherwise, your mindset will still be in the world. Your mind and heart will still be in the world when Sabbath comes and then the Sabbath won't benefit you or you know, you'll be in the wrong spirit. You have to prepare. Something's coming ahead. You have to prepare. 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 And every preparation is a process of time. It came to pass in the process of time. That's why we go back again to the uh, foolish virgins. They had no oil. What did they say? God, give us oil. Give us faith. Give us, give us hope. No magic wand there for faith and hope. You go out and buy. You go out and go through, have, go, go through your trials and experiences of faith and have hope build up in your heart and spirit and life from God cultivated in your heart. You go out and buy. And they went out and they bought, you see. But it was a process of time. So that's, uh, that's the uh, principles of, of preparation and then things happening suddenly. Because God doesn't take long to do anything. You know, Jesus came and He said, It's finished. He said, All things are now ready. My oxen and fatlings are killed and all of this has happened and I've gone and done this, and now I'm just seated, seated at the right hand of God, just expecting until my enemies be made my foot, my, uh, my enemies be made my footstool. 
Okay, so it's it's ready. What's the hang up? The work's all done. What's the hang up? Time. Yeah, time, preparation. preparation. We have to be ready. We have to be prepared yeah. to receive what's already been done. So once we're prepared, it doesn't take long to see the fulfillment yeah. of what he's already done. <laughs> you understand? So that should give some kind of hope that you know, we're waiting for things, we're waiting for things, we're waiting for things, we're hoping God will do this for us, deliver me from that, vindicate me about this, and whatever we were hoping in God for. Just have patience. And once you have patience and God, you're able to receive the promise of God, it won't take long at all. It won't take long. And you'll see the fulfillment of God's promise and God's purpose and the fulfillment of prophecy. All right, praise the Lord. I'm done.